Good evening and welcome to Cosmopolitan Pilgrim. This is our special series called Samaj, Sarkar and Bazaar. Cosmopolitan Pilgrim is a social content creation platform with educational and consultancy vertical. The link of our website is going below. We try to curate knowledge from the field and try to situate our own personal journeys within this bigger realm of Samaj, Sarkar and Bazaar. And to make the journey more easy for us, today we have a very special guest. We have the famous and very popular journalist and writer Deep Haldar. Deep has an uh, amazing more than two decade experience in journalism and his writings often reflect the intersection between the grassroots and the reality. We can very much say that we learn a lot about the Samaj, Sarkar and Bazaar through his popular works. Thank you, Deep Haldar. Thank you, Deep Da, for coming in and having this conversation with Cosmopolitan Pilgrim. We Thank all you. know Thank that. You. Thank you so much. Thank you for so much. Me. We all know that tomorrow is a very important day, not only for yeah. West Bengal, but in the entire discourse of political science and political sociology. Right. And there are too many interviews of yours already flooding the internet. So I'm not going to bore you with the mainstream questions like what do you think who is going to win tomorrow or what do you think yeah. about the right, right and left of West Bengal politics. But rather, I, I want you to educate us and the viewers of Cosmopolitan Pilgrim about the methodological portion of your works. The books that you have written are very interesting in the sense that they both dwell on very two difficult topics. One is a community that is very hard and difficult to penetrate. And another is the process that is so dynamic that you often lose track of where it started and where it is ending. Right. <laughs> so today, my questions will be more about the methodology and what exactly goes on in your mind when you think about narration and qualitative research. Right. So my first question to you is, the name of your first book is Blood Island, an oral history of the Marijjhapi massacre. And the second title of your book is Bengal 2021, an election diary. Right. Now, one of the common features in your dominant narration style is first an oral history and now a very free flowing writing style in your, this book, which is in a form of diary. Now, both reflect a feeling of being in a journey in documenting the body social. What makes you choose this narration style? How important is the idea of journey to you as a narrator and author? Well, the, the easy answer to this, Shritama, is uh, I'm not as educated as you are. I'm not, a, I'm, I'm not an academic. Oh, so I don't know how else to sort of uh, approach uh, the subjects that I approach. I have had some experience, uh, quite a bit of experience rather as a journalist, as you men mentioned, two decades. Uh, that's a lot of time uh, as a journalist. And uh, though now I do a very different job, I, I manage a newsroom. I've been doing that for the past 10 years. But my heart lies in going out on the field, uh, talking to people, uh, peeling off the layers, you know, uh, so to speak, and uh, getting, into, uh, getting into their minds. Uh, I think that's a very interesting process. And uh, you spoke about methodology. I don't have a methodology. The only methodology is to uh, be as true to what you see and hear uh, when you put them down. You know, when you write, you should be as as honest uh, as you possibly can to uh, what you have seen and heard when you are out there on the field. And when and uh, the second thing is to remove yourself, which is increasingly getting difficult for for journalists these days, to remove yourself from um, from the process. You know, you, there should not be too much of I me myself. You should let the person you are speaking to. You should let the person you are interviewing 
speak for herself or himself. You should not interject. You should uh, let it let uh, let that person get comfortable, tr uh, trust you, and then tell you her or his story. Uh, don't interrupt. Uh, don't uh, don't be uh, don't, don't sort of uh, try to uh, try to tell them. Try to prompt what they what they should say. But uh, be as easy on them as you possibly can, so that they feel comfortable enough to trust you and uh, tell you their story. I think that is the most important process. It's it's uh, it's not very easy. I think it's tough. Increasingly, it's tougher because you know there's there's so much noise in media, whether on TV or on in digital media. There's uh, sometimes the questions are way bigger than the answers. In an interview, you see the interviewer asking a one para question. And hardly leaving uh, the interviewee enough time for giving a half line or a line, you know, then he's going on to the next half one para question. I think that's problematic. I think uh, you should you should make your uh, make the person you're interviewing comfortable enough, trust you enough to tell you their story. I think that's that's most important for me because uh, you have gone there with a need, uh, a need to know, you know, which would perhaps then become an article or an essay or a book. So if you're going to uh, sort of, you know, introduce so much of yourself uh, before the process has even begun or when the process has just begun, how will you collect the raw material which you then process? So for me, that's the most important thing to be, uh, to be sort of, uh, to make your subject, uh, to make your interviewee feel comfortable uh, and to know her or his story as best as you possibly can. You mentioned about uh, getting into your respondent's head and not yeah. interrupting that person in the process yeah. and not making it all about I, me and myself. Yeah. Uh, so here comes my second question. Uh, it, this is regarding your first book, uh, Blood Island, where in many a times you have mentioned about Mana Goldar, a daughter yeah. of a victim of Marijapi resident. And right. she was staying at your place. Yeah. Now, I feel the book had a personal connect for you yes other than just being a subject as a journalist for you to delineate upon now how do you navigate this insider and outs outsider status while doing your field research especially on a controversial and uh, i must say a little bit stigmatized and difficult to trust community Right. It's an interesting question. It's a very good question, Shitama, because I knew of the story of Morichapi from a survivor of Morichapi, Morichapi as a child. Yeah. It was there in my consciousness when I approached the subject, when I decided to write the book, which is perhaps why I took, took so much time uh, to write it. So it, would, it almost took me five years. Five so, years, yes. Uh, yeah. So a lot of time was uh, I spent in trying to find out, uh, find out survivors. So I didn't want to do the easy job of just talking to two, three people who I knew, uh, you know, finding Mana and then, you know, speak to Mana's neighbor and then just put a book together. I, I, I in fact, went from state to state. So, uh, so Mana I found in Bengal. Uh, some of the other survivors I find found in Bengal. I went to Madhya Pradesh. I went to Chhattisgarh, you know. So, three states. Uh, I, I, and uh, very difficult uh, sort of, uh, uh, some of them were very difficult to find. Uh, so I took a lot of time in trying to find the survivors so that, um, uh, I don't, uh, I don't complete the, I, I, I don't, I don't complete the book by only speaking to people I know or their friends or relatives. So that's one. Uh, the second thing is, uh, it's not just the task of finding survivors that, uh, made the book difficult or, uh, made me take so much time to complete it. It's also the fact that for very long, I debated how to write the book. So like I said, that the, the idea was to, was to detach myself. In fact, interestingly, in one of the book talks that I had uh, in Delhi, a gentleman said that he loved the book and he, he got up to speak about my book. He quoted from the book and then he looked at me and said that, how can you write a book like this and still be so detached? He said, when I, when I read this book, I found uh, that the way you have written the book, it's beautifully written, but there's also a sense of detachment from a, from a massacre that's so horrific. So how did you not break down? Uh, he said, I don't know whether you break down while writing it or while interviewing, but at least that sense is not coming in the book when I read it as a reader. 
So he said, while it's it's an interesting way to write, but how could you possibly write it? I don't know. I think uh, I think that's the only way to uh, for me to approach a subject. Uh, if you do not, if you cannot detach, how would you sort of uh, how would you do justice to your craft? There is another. There is another. In, in, interestingly, there is another way of uh, way of doing journalism. You know, it's called Gonzo journalism. uh my favorite journalist hunter thompson so he uh, he used to say that objectivity is rubbish and he would uh, he would become a subject of his own stories you know he, uh, he wrote about sex drugs and rock and roll and biker gangs and all of that so he lived that life and he often introduced himself in the stories that he wrote and i find him i find him fascinating but uh, in the two books that i have written i mean uh blood island and now the election book i there there is i cannot possibly sort of you know do a gonzo journalism i i am anyway detached i mean i can i am not a i am not a survivor uh, of mori chappi i am not a i am not a sort of um, in for the second book the people i spoke to so some are from the class i belong to but i i have also gone uh, gone down and gone up in a manner of speaking uh, through the classes various classes to uh, bring out the sense of bengal uh, in an all important election year so for me the only way to do it is to be is to not get involved is to be detached and like i said is to let them speak for themselves and then uh, put that out as honestly as I, as honestly and as truthfully as i can you talked about going to madhya pradesh now yeah. going to different states is is actually a very difficult process in field research so yeah. in uh, in academics uh, we have this thing called rapo building before yeah. entering into a community uh, what is it like for you as a journalist come researcher come writer to penetrate into a community and do the trust building process what is your funda of doing the trust building i think see uh, since i have uh, spent so much time ashita uh, in journalism i think it's easier now so i have i think organically uh, grown as a as a as a journalist or you know uh, even you can say as a field researcher when i am doing my book uh, so unconsciously i think i have adopted some uh, tricks of the trade uh, which uh, makes me uh, sort of talk to people also ease them up for them to talk to me uh but like i said the most important thing and this i find increasingly a problem there is so much of i me myself you know in even in young journalists there you have celebrity journalists and you also have these young journalists and they're always out there trying to interpret trying, trying to put out their own two bits i mean all that is fine but when you're reporting a story you know let the story speak for itself uh you do the you do the space, you know journalists traditionally were known as fly in the wall, flies in the wall so you are like the, the it is the, the image imagery is very interesting so you are a fly in the wall you know unnoticed and you are observing the observing the room so you should take yourself away while being there you should somehow uh sort of uh, how do i put it you should somehow become one with the background you know so that uh, the person or persons you are speaking to you know they feel comfortable enough to to express themselves fully you know to bear themselves uh you should repeat your questions sometimes you should come back to asking the same because people lie you know yeah uh, people often lie as we would know tomorrow <laughs> perhaps <laughs> people have lied you know to yeah. uh, to uh, to the to, to all this um, you know election data that people collect so if you go and ask who have you voted for so you think you know the answer but sometimes you don't and you go horribly wrong you know sephology why does that happen because voters lie yeah. so um, and especially you know you have to be very careful like you mentioned madhya pradesh you are you can't uh, you are a certain way you know everybody is a certain way so you look a certain way you dress a certain way you speak a certain way no matter which which language you are speaking in for instance my books are in my books are about bengal so i speak in bengali but perhaps but people speak bengali differently in different regions right exactly. if you look sundarbans you don't speak the same bengali that you speak in kolkata if you go to kuch bihar you have a very different dialect right so the uh, somebody from north bengal would uh, would speak a very different tongue than somebody who's in the southernmost tip of bengal 
okay and across so somebody in medinipur would speak very differently very differently uh, from someone like you so um so it's it's immediately a uh, an outsider insider thing that comes into play exactly. so yeah so what you mentioned uh, so for instance uh, you know in the height of corona uh, last year i i took a sanitizer a bottle of sanitizer must up took a card and uh, did my travels to find out about uh what what people are feeling about being so i went to shingur uh, i went near the bonga border with bangladesh uh, i went to thakur nagar the mutua community spent a, almost a day there so they see you get out of a car with a sanitizer bottle in hand mask on nobody was was wearing a mask there so immediately there is a, there, there immediately they place you as an outsider you know so you have to did you, have... did you take off your mask then yeah when i did you... i did, okay. I did. i did i mean not something i uh, maybe we should be speaking on camera but i did because i had to somehow uh, make them feel comfortable with me so one of the things you need to have with you ideally is time because you can't uh, you can't hurry this up for instance i am very very critical of television journalism you know because they also they did sometimes do amazing work but when you go there when a correspondent goes there a celebrity anchor goes somewhere with a mic in hand you know and a cameraman following her or him yeah. i think it's it's not reality anymore it's hyper reality the person you are talking to even if that person is not outright lying to you the person is also imagining himself uh, on tv you know and the, in his head he knows that okay he is the star now because people are going to see him in a day from now or live so he is also i think accent accentuating certain things so the lies start there so uh, what is very important in field research is time so that you have you give the person the opportunity to to relax you know with you and your questions you know and also you so you can't adopt the tongue you and you should not also perhaps try to but what you can do is not uh, not give him a sense of superiority that uh, especially when you go to those regions you know uh, you should uh, you should you should sound empathetic uh, if you are going to ask him very tough questions like for instance my first book you need to need to so in the process of putting it down you can be detached but in the process of helping him uh, unwind you need to have enough empathy in you so that he feels that he is not because you know these are these are very deep wounds 41 years ago massacre happened but even then uh, when i was doing my research and I, when i met those people grown men grown women they broke down okay so um, like i said so you need time and you need empathy to make that person feel comfortable enough with you to to narrate his story or else he's 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 going to straight away lie or sort of you know ask you to leave and that too has happened um, or you know give give very sketchy answers and that won't help you in your work so i think those are very important things has it ever happened that uh, you asked someone a question and that person gave answers and you didn't believe yes it has happened you know especially with the numbers in morichappi numbers are fantastical somebody saying 10000 people are killed somebody saying 5000 people are killed so one of the things i did in the book i, I so i did not want to correct them so i said in the introduction to the book that yeah. the numbers differ but i wanted to be as true to their story as possible and that's also my biggest defense so whenever people from the left attack me saying that you know uh, so i yeah. said look it's not me saying it it's survivors of the massacre saying it you believe them or you don't but the point is are you going to pull them down for narrating their own story so yeah uh, people lie i mean i don't think they they always lie lie but like i said you know they accentuate what happened they sort of uh, so say so 10 people were killed i'm saying somewhere but you say hundreds of people were killed but you know that's something um, not not for not just when you are writing a book or somebody's uh, like this or somebody is telling you about a tragedy that happened 40 years ago that also happens now you know people somehow you, you 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 know you just say these things hundreds of people were killed thousands of people there was a large crowd thousands were were there but maybe hundreds were there did you count oh. so 
so i mean but people just say yeah. them, know, but that's that's okay too uh, as long as you carry on with the conversation and then you eventually come to a point through questions and counter questions that you somewhere get a sense of the truth you know so uh, so yes i have got a sense of uh, like for instance when i was uh, interviewing uh, kanti ganguly so he was lying so i know and he knew he knew, he knew that i knew that he was lying but um, but that's okay i had to have a have a voice from the left and a, a, a credible voice from the left who was who was in government when all of this was happening so i had to let him speak so even him i did not contradict i i told him during the course of the interview that people i spoke to have a very different thing to say but yeah. he carried on with his untruth slash lie and i knew it but uh, i still had to hear his story so you know the, the kanti ganguly again is a very different uh, sort of uh, methodology you had to apply because you know he is lying yeah he knows that uh, you are not going to show him in a good light <laughs> yet i wanted to have as much time as i possibly can from him because i wanted him to be a whole chapter because there should be should have been like it was one credible voice from the left now others refused to speak to me so for my own need to have a voice from the left who i was blaming or the or the or the ca- different characters of my book were blaming for the massacre there should have been one voice or else it would have, it would not have been objective at all so for me even when i knew he is lying even when he knew that i am there to talk about something which would come out as a book and not make him or his party look good it was important yeah. for me to make him comfortable enough to carry on with his lies you know so yeah. uh, so that i could i could write more i could i i could i could go into his mind perhaps and see that what is making him lie or whether there is a, any any trace of remorse in him as a leftist for what happened what his party did uh so yeah sometimes you have to do, do that also sometimes when you know somebody is lying but you still have to let that person carry on to to eventually add to the story that you are writing you said that time is a very important factor when it comes to field research yeah you spent 5 years researching the community it is commendable yeah. how do you yeah. do it what kept you going so this was a i mean uh, this the second book was a faster book it, it took uh, <laughs> it took a few months but it was an election book uh, what i think the story and um, i think it was such a powerful story i uh, i hope nobody nobody goes through something like this like that's one of the first stories i heard you know i was very young when i heard it one of my childhood memories is of morin chappi and it's a very uh, so my parents had no idea that mana and i were discussing morin chappi she was there as a survivor my father happened to know her father and they were hiding from the police you know uh, there were there were murders and rapes and you know there was a huge clamp down on survivors of morin chappi she was introduced to me as an elder cousin uh she was saying in a house so uh, for a for a five year old child to sort of hear stories of stories that he couldn't even process properly you know the import of the, all the things she was saying uh but it stayed in my mind so when i um, when i was writing the book i one of the one of the fears i had that i should i, I should not mess it up you know i should not write something that is um, that, uh, that 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 doesn't do justice to the horror of morichappi to the memory of morichappi uh thankfully uh, i mean apart from whatever people said good bad ugly uh apart from all the criticism and now it's going to be a film uh i think what is most satisfying is uh, when the book reached uh survivors who can read it because it's in english it's not been translated yet in in bengali they were very happy with it so that was a huge relief that when some of those who who can read the language when they got the book and they read it they called to say that they they thought it's a good book they thought that it has been written properly so i think that got me going to uh, that i should not mess it up you know so i had to i had to go back so sometimes even while writing a chapter particular chapter you know i was in uh, suppose i was in delhi so i would take a flight and come to Uh, come to kolkata then take a car to sundarban spend two days there because i had perhaps enough enough material in my notebook uh on my phone uh, in as audio uh, to write out but i still wanted to clarify i still wanted a little bit more nuance 
So that get, got me going to do justice to the story of Maureen Chappie. You talked about your memories when you were a five-year-old kid, when you were just listening to the stories. So in social sciences, we indulge a lot in memory and oral history-based researches, like partition research, for example. Yeah. What do you think of memory as an important methodological tool for the research? Memory is a, is a very, uh, very, very important tool for research. I mean, um, if you if you were to write a partition book now, so there there's enough and there's enough material, but suppose you want to still interview people. I mean, they are not necessarily uh, going through books, you know, or uh, watching films on partition or watching documentaries, right? If they're victims of partition, they may be very old. They some of them may be semi literate, illiterate. Uh, their memory memories, uh, the mind might be failing them, but it would still be so interesting to to find, to seek them out, to talk to them, you know, and if you do that, no matter what methodology you adopt, no matter what kind of book you're writing, I'm sure your work is going to be very enriched. If you can add uh, the recollections of somebody who has gone through that, exactly. as opposed to, you know, even if you're doing a doctoral thesis, I think it would be, or writing an academic paper and not a book or not a, not a, say, not a script for a film. It would be wonderful, I think, if you were, if you were to do, if you were to do some work on partition to find out voices from that era, you know, to add to your, to add to your academic research, to add to the stuff that's already there. So uh, for that, memory is extremely important. I mean, uh, that's even if, even if there are gaps, like I said, you know, it happened with the, with the, with Blood Island, from chap chapter to chapter as you go, there are little discrepancies in terms of what exactly happened because 41 years ago. But, uh, you know, it's you, if you have read the book, I, I believe. So you, yes. even with those discrepancies, uh, it, 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 you almost get transported to that time. You know, uh, yeah. when, you, when you brought people to remember things from the past and remember such powerful things. Uh, so I think memory is extremely, extremely, ex there's, a, there's, a, there's a very interesting Milan Kundera quote on this that I'm forgetting, I think from his book, Immortality, uh, on memory and for forgetting. It's, a, it's one of my favorite quotes and I quote it often, I'm forgetting now, but it's a wonderful, one, uh, wonderful uh, quote. Uh, it will come to me, I'll tell you. It's a beautiful quote on memory and forgetting. Did you ever try to... Um... Did you ever try to um, elicit objectivity from memory? Or do you want to keep it in the subjective realm of our mind? Uh, the first, uh, sorry, the second, I, I want to keep it subjective. Uh, I want the, the, the reader to sort of uh, draw his own conclusions from what I want to say. Mm, because that, that's that's why I talk to uh, talk to so many people. If you see in both the books, I don't yeah. talk, to, uh, talk, to, uh, talk to people. First book is a different thing. But in the, in the second book, I could have been around and spoken to people from my comfort zone, you know, people who are easy to find. Uh, I mean, for writing a chapter on Singur, for instance, with which I end the book, I didn't need to really go to Singur and, uh, you know, spend a whole day, uh, you know, going through the lanes and by lanes of Singur and finding out people. Uh, I could have, I, I'm a journalist, I have, I could easily write a chapter on Singur and what it meant then, what it means now. There's so many articles. But uh, the reason I do it, the reason I include so many voices is because, um, I want the reader when the when he when, when she or he comes back to my book to draw him, her or his own conclusion. I don't want to be objective. I want to I want to I want the reader to be objective and the reader to have his own the readers conclusion. to interpret their own understanding. Yes. Yes. Active readers. Yes. Not passive ones. 
active readers yes yeah uh, now keeping the memories aside how do you feel when you visit sundarban now can you extract geographical and natural beauty from a place uh, keeping aside the historical scandals what do you think so here my uh, my detachment fails uh which i it truly fails because uh, every time i have been to sundarbans i have not been able to look at it uh perhaps because of the time i have invested in sundarbans you know to write the book unfortunately i have not been able to look at sundar it's it's, it's a beautiful place you know sundarbans it's a state of mind but um i have not been able to look at maybe sometime in the future when i go again but I, every time i go to sundarbans and think of more chapi no matter where in sundarbans i am yeah uh, so uh, here i have failed in my own methodology i can't apply it on myself uh, any more i cannot even when the book is done i every time i am in sundarbans for whatever reason you know people sometimes say my friends from delhi say that let's go to sundarbans we'll party i yeah. india sort of uh, disturbs me i said no i can't i mean you go i will give you contacts but i can't go to sundarbans to party because for me it is it is where a mass massacre happened uh, so sundarbans is very dark uh, uh for me uh it's still yeah. so uh, at some point in the future perhaps i'd be able to look at it look at the beauty of the place it's it's a beautiful place and uh people who stay in sundarbans now they don't most of them don't know the young generation don't know about morichappi the fathers or grandfathers would but it it was it's a tiny island so it's not as if you know it, it's like saying that uh, bhopal has not been able to move away from the from the gas tragedy union carbide gas tragedy so it's a bit like that it has of course i mean it's, it's i've spent spent time in bhopal it's a wonderful city and uh, it's only outsiders who remember the gas tragedy insiders do but they have moved beyond it uh, but i can't because uh, for me sundarbans is morichappi morichappi sundarbans i have not been able to get out of it uh, in my mind i don't think this is exactly your case i think many of your readers who have read the book like for example yeah. for me i just cannot differentiate between the two right now whenever i go to sundarban or like you said when your friends say let's go and party when my yeah. friends say let's go and hang out yeah I, i just i can't do that and somehow i feel sometimes that how can i relate to beauty of a place without yeah. uh, getting into the historical context of that so, yeah i think the narration has to do a lot with that yeah it's been a year since your uh, book on mari jhapi came out blood island uh, automatically questions and maps the audacity nature and length of state sponsored operation your coming book or your recent book actually focuses on the electoral process or the electoral journey which is uh, which a state actually goes through like a big mm -hmm. ceremonial process of institutionalization of the idea of state how do you reflect how do you see the institution of state i don't uh, it's a very academic question i the state has been defined in various ways but i don't think of the state too much the state does not uh, does not interest me that much it's the people that interest me uh i i i let me I, just I, rephrase here a yeah, bit do you think yeah. of mari jhapi or the operation that has been done on the people of mari jhapi when you covered this uh, election rallies or when you go and interview some uh, big shot politicians does that impact you somewhere in your yeah, mind yeah it does of course it does it does uh, and i am uh, every time i interview uh, uh, a top politician you know from anywhere in the country i even even uh, why just the country i always look at a politician through the prism of people you know for instance i was in the us uh, 3 years ago uh, with uh, with a state department fellowship uh, and i it was as part of the fellowship i had to meet uh, from wherever i went i had to meet the governor members of the governor's office and all of that but i would always look at them through the prism of people you know uh so yeah i i in my mind i i do that so it's it's not just morichappi i think as a journalist you need to you need to constantly question the state uh you need to sort of uh not that the state is not capable of anything good or not that not that the state is always hostile to people state But is I, a necessary evil can we say that yes it is it is uh, but i think as a journalist you need to sort of you need to look at the state through the prism of people 
you are not the state. I think uh, no matter how big you think you are, you are not the state. You are the people, and you are their voice. So I think that is one thing. Whichever party you support, see journalists also. I mean, uh, support political parties. They go to vote. They're part of society. So, but whatever you need to sort of, uh, you are you are never the state. Uh, you are always the people. So I think that's one thing that has to be kept in mind. That is also one thing that uh, made me uh, use the name Samaj Sarkar and Bazaar. It's like you yeah. know, the entire thing is all about these three things. Yeah. Um, coming to my next question, uh, interviewing victims of a state-sponsored operation and interviewing a group of power elites who are in bed with the state, how do you navigate this in your mind? Is there a process where you compartmentalize the two? Uh, no, I think it's early training as a journalist. Um, I, uh, you know, I think it's very easy to sort of, uh, I'll, 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 I'll answer this question differently. You know, I have, uh, there was a time when I was, when I was younger and I, I used to like watching uh, Shah Rukh Khan films. So the first time I, I saw Shah Rukh Khan, met Shah Rukh Khan for an interview, I took a young colleague with me uh, and she was, so excited I, I took her because you know she said that i can i boss can i go with you because i want to meet Sharukh. and i said okay tag along we'll do the interview jointly so she was uh so mesmerized and so thrilled to see him that she pounced on him you know hugged him kissed him on the cheek wanted a picture taken so it was all very nice and this thing but i have never had that uh, uh for mr khan when i, I used to like his films or for anybody else, when I when I'm going there as a journalist, I think uh, in my mind uh, somewhere. So when I'm watching a film or hearing a speech on TV, say, uh, um, or appreciating a book written by a writer, that me is different from the me who's who's meeting that person later to do an interview. So I think these are two very different me's. And to answer you, no, it's not. I'm still thinking of the questions and I'm still thinking, uh, do I have some more time with this person so that I can uh, I can sort of ease him up and ease her up and ask a few more questions. It's the same for a politician. It's the same for a person uh, who, who's down and out, you know, or is a, is a victim of some unfortunate incident. However, uh, if it's a politician and not a common man, it's the process is tougher because the government, politician is is trained to bluff you or to sort of to to uh, take you away from the truth and show to show him show himself in the best light so i think it's tougher you enjoy with the people more you're admitting I, of you course, enjoy with the people more. more because it's a uh, with a politician it's like a game of chess you know he's trying to hide you're you're trying to extract he's trying to hide you're trying to extract same with uh, same with film personalities they would want every ans answer to every question you ask to show them in a in good light People don't normally do that. Uh, norm, ordinary people don't do that. They sort of, uh, like I said, if you if you give them enough time, if you if you if you make them feel comfortable, they generally open up and say things that are true. But uh, you know, with polit politicians and uh, and film stars or sports stars, it's always if 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 if, if what if it's not blatant lies, it's various versions of the truth that you come up with and then they have image managers who train them to answer uh, to give the right answers to questions you know sometimes you have to send questions before so that they prepare uh, so this process is very artificial with with, with big shots uh, but with common people it's nicer because uh, there's an element of vulnerability there's an element of vulnerability they sometimes uh, say things they don't want to say then they say Acha, please don't publish this this will put me into trouble. It has happened so much, so much with me in the course of this current book that I wrote. I mean, people have opened up and said, "Can you please not write this because you know I am afraid for my life or for my life for my life or some political uh, local dada will come and beat me up." Uh, businessmen have said this. Can you please not take my name because I fear for my life and for my business. I have to. You will go away. You will write a book. You'll publish it. You'll go away. I have to stay here. Uh, so it has happened a lot. So that, you know that's honesty. That's honesty. Uh, that's vulnerability on display. But with politicians, that doesn't happen. They are they are they are so seasoned. They just the right thing to you. 
you know uh, to show themselves in good light so it's it's it, it's a bit boring also to talk to politicians uh they're extremely boring i mean because they are always ready with the right answers right. that is that is uh, that's problematic your last book was on dalit identity yeah now the current book is on an election that stands heavily on the shoulders of identity politics if i may ask what is identity for you and how far you believe in the social identities of caste class religion ethnicity etc i am i am privileged enough uh, shridama to say that uh, what is the name of this uh, of this uh, session what is the name of this tamar uh, sarkar bazar no uh, what are you calling yourself cosmopolitan pilgrim the name of the venture is cosmopolitan pilgrim yes. so yeah yeah so it's it's it, it's a good it's a good name cosmopolitan pilgrim so i'm privileged enough to think of myself as a cosmopolitan pilgrim where identity doesn't matter neither of caste or class or uh, religion but uh, society doesn't function sadly uh, in this way and uh, it's, it's it's from a position of extreme privilege that i can say that these things don't matter to me but i do realize that you know uh, the person who's on the uh, who's bearing the brunt of of a riot or of a massacre uh, cannot think this way sometimes your name even if you don't think of yourself in a certain way your name gives you away you know depending on where you are and which it, it can happen to any community any time so it it's it's just it's a time and place so uh, some of us are very privileged most of us are not but for me it does not it identity interests me uh, but it doesn't affect me uh, personally but it, it interests me when i when i look at it uh, objectively when i look at it uh, from the prism of a journalist or a writer but personally it doesn't really bother me at all or i don't think about it also so my interactions are never on the basis of uh, identity I, i'd like to believe that i can sort of mix with uh, every kind of people and not sort of have a have a fixed notion like i i mentioned to you my my trip to the us you know uh, there are there are bars called dive bars which are cheap bars so i used to always go to the dive bars you know but it it it, it was a very prestigious fellowship so you would be taken to fancy places but i would get very bored i said you know let me get a feel of the place so when i went to sacramento which is in california i was in we were in dc of course uh went to Sacra sacramento los angeles but then when we went to uh, texas we used to go to those dive bars you know so i because i wanted to know how texas feels like and i didn't want uh, only people from the state department telling me what america is like so i used to tell them let's go and they also uh, uh, at the end of the program realized that uh, they have to take me to those uh, to those cheap bars so that i can mingle with people and not to those you know to those fancy places only so yeah so for me i think uh, people interest me and their identity is their is their religion that doesn't interest me at all um there are old identities like caste class religion and ethnicity in your current book you mentioned about a new social identity a bengali consumer yeah tell us more about this new social identity the bengali consumer bengali yes, should be consumer you were talking more about the consumerism in the west bengal and the bengali culture right now that we cannot yeah. just yeah talk bengaliness only think, as one factor of being bengali you would be able to answer this better but i think when i was growing up i i uh, and when later i was when i was growing up i was in college and then university i found a lot of hypocrisy with people most of the people not all who 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 said things like simple living high thinking i i i i'd like to believe that people young people like you are interested in in good things in life and are not sort of or uh, not averse to saying that you want to you want more from life but i think the, uh, uh, several years uh, several decades in bengal has been spent in hypocrisy in saying that you don't you don't you don't crave good things in life while internally you did so uh, i think opportunities should come to bengal uh, being, so you think that uh, uh, consumerism is not necessarily a bad thing you know there is a there is a there is a uh, sunil ganguly poem 
uh, which went something like, you know, uh, he wrote that, uh, so what, uh, I'm a poet, I still ride a Pontiac car, so what, I'm a poet, I'll still have the best chick, the fleshiest chicken leg. So I think, uh, so there, there are, in, in art, you know, there are all kinds of people. There, there are, there's the example of Van Gogh, who, who was dirt poor. And there's the, there's the story of him cutting off his earlobe when he couldn't pay the prostitute he had visited. And there's the story of uh, Van, uh, this, this is Van Gogh story. There's a story of Picasso, who was, who, who knew how to sell his art and who was, who, who made uh, amazing art, you know, cubism. And but who was also money minded. So I don't think these are this these two things are necessarily uh, uh, the, the, these two things can, can't necessarily coexist. I think it can, it can exist. Uh, I think Bengal needs industry. Uh, Bengalis in Bengal need to get paid well. While we should not let go of our culture. So you so think a rise in consumerism can be a deciding factor in this election twenty twenty one? It can be, it can be, of course. I think the craving for more, you know, uh, and not just to sort of criticize uh, what you can't get, you know, not so, not always be in the in in the critics mode, and uh, wanting more from the from the state, uh, I think can be a deciding factor. Where you say that we need we need. Uh, we need jobs, you know, we need opportunities. Why does the young of Bengal necessarily, most of them, uh, have to go out of the state to get a job? Why can't those jobs come here? I we need free vaccines. We need free vaccines, yeah. So, um, so I, um, so of course, I think these are questions that, that, that are coming to people's minds. Our media needs to be more robust and uh, bigger channels need to come here, bigger newspapers need to come here. All of it need to, needs to happen while not letting go of who we are. We don't need to be some other state, but we, we can be better versions of ourselves. Okay. West Bengal election has been a very colorful event so far. Uh, yeah. What are your favorite highlights? Uh, uh, Firstly, the election, uh, the time we are speaking, Shritama, I think uh, we are going through a, going it's through a, a second, wind wave of, uh, second wave of COVID. So yeah. I think the election should not have, should not have happened this way. Uh, but you know, we don't live in an ideal live in an ideal world. Um, I think one of the things I said on TV also, Mamta Banerjee going to Nandigram and saying I am a Hindu Brahmin, I found extremely funny. Because if you remember that uh, Mamta Banerjee rose to, in a sense, Nandigram and then Shingur. The subaltern uh, movement. Yeah. The put Mamta Banerjee uh, to the throne of Bengal. You know, Mamta Banerjee's rise to power happened through Nandigram and to Shingur. She doesn't need to play any card in Nandigram, ideally. Than the fact that she's Mamta Banerjee. It's her place, right? And the moment you say I'm a Hindu Brahmin, you are, I think, playing into the BJP's hands. Because it's BJP's card, you know, to play on a Hindu identity. It's such a BJP thing to do. But, but I think that I, I was on TV when that happened. The day she said it, I was on TV in the afternoon and I Shiva Rudra or anchor and I was discussing this. And I told him that, you know, she it's it's funny that she's saying it because she is now playing by the rules. Uh, made by the BJP. Mr. Dilip Ghosh, who I interviewed also a few days ago, his uh, many comments are extremely interesting and they make great headlines. Uh, they offend people. Uh, people have a problem. Sometimes even from the BJP, many people have problem in digesting what he says. Uh, Onuprodo Mondol is a, is a very colorful character. I was uh, somebody, a gentleman I know personally well, uh, Dr. Anirban Ganguly, who is the BJP's Bolpur candidate. I know him from Delhi. Uh, it was interesting when I went to Bolpur to sort of write about Bolpur and there uh, there was this uh, binary that had been set up by the time I went to Bol Bolpur, Dhanav versus Devta. I also wrote about it. So people yeah, called him. There was a tweet about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So people thought of him as, uh, spoke about him as a Devta because, you know, he's fair skinned and, you know, he, he talks very well. And uh, Anurudha Mondol is a certain way. I don't want to say he's the Dhanav, but he's a certain of a certain way. And he's the local muscle man. 
so there was this Deva, devta versus danav i found that very interesting that in tego town you know there's a there's a there's a binary has been established be, between somebody who's come from delhi but who people are taking taking to i don't know what the what the what the results will say tomorrow uh it's a, it's been a very interesting election the violence is very unfortunate but in bengal we have had a history of political violence the violence is extremely unfortunate uh the other day you uh, bombs were hurled in kolkata when was the last time you saw that so um you have to wait and watch what happens tomorrow but i think the election had a lot of highlights um and uh, the most important thing is nobody knows for sure what's going to happen tomorrow exactly yeah it's such a tight race nobody knows and anybody who's saying oh i know i mean if you if you belong to either one of the two parties you can perhaps say that oh i'm very positive and bjp is sweeping to power or trinamool is going to retain power but to be told i don't think anybody knows uh, everybody is playing safe now that you mentioned about mamta banerji referring herself as the brahmin identity i again go back to my identity question and uh, Uh, i feel there has been a polarization between a uh, subaltern identity versus the so called bhojo lok identity yeah and this also brings me to my next question that there has been a politicization of the popular song called tumpa shona when yes, the left yes. actually uh, played that in their rally yeah so there seems to be an uh, element of identity into it and uh, what do you think about it the song why oh, i love the song but <laughs> not the song the politicization yes. of the song and using it as a, a debate you know it is very um, very interesting shritama hello can you hear me yeah 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 so i think it's uh, it's very interesting that uh, before i come to tumpa or the left <laughs> using the song uh, it's very interesting that a party that has been called the a manu the manuvadi party you know bjp it's essentially a brahmin baniya construct uh, has played a very different game in bengal bjp has politically at least if not socially turned bengal downside up you know bjp has both in 2019 in the lok sabha polls and perhaps this time too bjp would get a huge chunk of the dalit vote it has happened because over the years the rss and the bjp they have worked among the dalits among the lowest of the low in our caste system and somehow managed to convince them that they are the answer you know so uh you know somebody who is sort of uh, who's constantly a party which is constantly called uh, various kinds of things uh, especially from the prism of caste outside bengal in bengal decides to get the maximum number of votes from the dalit caste you know dalits the obcs i think that is a very interesting identity politics that the bjp has played and if the left which has uh, traditionally spoken of a classless casteless society if the left finally threw a song by adopting a song called which is a subaltern song yeah tumpa shona tries to get into finally finally get into the um, you know uh, walks their talk so to say because you know if you see all the top left leaders traditional left leaders have al- always been upper caste yeah uh, while they have always spoken about classless casteless society mori chapi many yeah. would argue though i have not said it in the book but many would many would argue is a is a story of uh, dalit atrocity uh, atrocity against dalits so if the if through a song they have realized their mistake and they are trying to sort of be uh, identify with the subalterns i think it's a, it's a welcome change okay so tumba shona is a welcome change yeah and with this we are coming yeah. back we are coming to the last question of this section if you have to pick one which one would you pick covering elections or documenting critical humanitarian crisis humanitarian crisis it's a very difficult question what would i want to pick i think one doing one book uh, 
left me quite scarred you know blood island left me quite scarred and disturbed uh, elections is always easy because uh, it's a easy book uh, it's an easy thing to do because you can travel you're anyway a journalist you have to anyway watch news constantly you in the course of your work meet politicians uh, uh, you meet political activists you're yourself uh, abreast of the news so uh, i don't know uh, and it i think it's uh, the, writing a book like blood island takes a lot away from you and leaves you deeply deeply scarred so um, uh, i don't know whether i want to write any books any more books at all but uh, the subject should interest me I, i guess i think i should be interested enough in the subject to write write a book this was a this was a quick book uh, so though uh, sort of when i was into it you know i uh, like i said like for one para uh you know i would often go back take the car out even during corona i would sort of uh, travel for 5 hour, hours into bengal because i thought that no no i need one more voice i need to sort of spend one more afternoon in a certain place to get the flavor of the chapter right so uh but it was still an easy book to write so i don't know i don't know what uh, what i'd want to do but the subject should interest me i guess okay thank you so much deepda for answering all my questions and educating us with knowledge right from the field we are hoping to catch up with you later with our another series about the same until then take care and thank you so much thank and you and i'll go with the i'll go with the hashtag that deep haldar is a cosmopolitan pilgrim please do thank you so much it's a wonderful name thank you so much take thank care you. thank you